help me believe in what I can be and all that I am. Show me the stairway. I have to climb. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking from you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. Lord, you remember Amen. when you walked among Jesus, you know if you're looking below that it's worse now than then. Pushing and shoving, crowding my mind. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day. translated in many languages, and I'm sure you've heard it, and I hope it blesses you today as we sing it for you. You know it already, don't you? The chimes of time ring out the news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell Was that someone you You may have longed for And it strength your courage to renew Do not be disheartened For I have news
there is no night for it is light you'll never walk alone always feel at home wherever you may roam there is no power can conquer you if God is on your side, just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others he'll do for you here's what he is with arms wide open he'll pardon you it is no secret what God can do it is so glad that I know the Lord and I'm saved. And if you're here and you're not saved, today is a day of salvation. And I'd encourage you to trust Jesus as your Savior. And you know what? Uh, we're sending this out on the internet, uh, on, on our Facebook page, and on YouTube. And if you're watching us today and you've never seen us, we want to invite you to stay and listen. Because I know God has something for you today and He wants to bless you and help you and encourage you. And we are the Glory Bound Baptist Church, 23, 2283 Northwest Loop, in the metropolis of Stephenville, Texas. But we're as close as your computer, and God willing, we'll be here every week for you to give you a Bible message that will bless your heart. And if you're not saved, we're praying that today you get saved. And if you're saved and away from the Lord, we invite you to take God up on what we just sang. It is no secret what God can do for you if you'll let Him work in your life. That's the key right there. We're glad you're here. We hope this sermon is a blessing to you, wherever you might be today, around the world. Well, we all love our dads, don't we? Amen. <laughs> Except the times when we needed to get spanked. We probably remember those times. I'm sure I do. And uh, those of us who, whose fathers have passed away, we have some good memories of our past. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, do you remember anything that your dad ever did that was really dumb? I mean, out downright stupid. You remember any of that? Something he did, and you knew when it was happening that it wasn't very smart. You're probably like that. I'm like that myself. And I know that both of my sisters and my mom are watching this today on the Internet. I know that. So I'm, what I'm going to say to them, what to you folks, they're going to say, oh, yeah, that happened. They're going to remember that. So it's kind of like Throwback Sunday today, man. All right. My dad never let anyone tell him what to do. I don't know if your dad was like that, but my dad, you couldn't tell him what to do. Now, if he wanted to do something, it was okay. But you couldn't tell him what to do. And he was Dal A. Ray, and he did whatever he wanted to do. And uh, But one day, it backfired on him. I was there. I saw it. My mom was there, too. Well, we had a storage problem in our house in California, and you've probably done this yourself. We bought a, he bought a storage shed from Sears, okay? I think it was 9 by 12. It could have been 10 by 12. I don't remember. But anyway, he got the box and tore it open, and we had a cement pad there next to the house for him to put it up. He had tools and everything. And he even had this thing called an assembly manual right here. He had that right there. So he starts to work on stuff, and I looked at the manual. It was on the ground, and I said, Dad, don't you want to look at the manual first? He said, no, nah, I don't need no manual. And he got his electric drill out with a drill bit in that, and he starts drilling holes in that zing, zing, zing. And, and it had the drills already pre-drilled, the holes. He was drilling away, 
And he put that thing up, and it looked kind of like this. And he said, there, I put it up. <laughs> and it looked terrible. And we had, to, we had to put up with that for the rest of his life. And, of course, stuff is in it. But it looks crazy. I don't think anybody would want to go into it. What's in there? But what am I trying to say is, I knew that he was in deep water because he threw the manual away, like I just did a minute ago. And he knew it all. He was just going to do his thing. And he didn't care, but hair left the governor. You ever heard that before? Amen. He, he didn't care, nothing about that. So he suffered, the, we suffered the consequences of him doing it his way. And today, we want to talk about this sermon topic, doing it your way. Do it your way and see what happens. That's the sermon today. Do it your way and see what happens. And the verse we're going to use for a text it's Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25. I may refer to it here. I don't know if I will the rest of it or not, but we'll throw it out there for what it's worth. You'll get the gist when you read it. Proverbs chapter number 16 and verse 25 while you're looking. And let me challenge all of you listening to me today. If you don't know the names of the books of the Bible by memory, learn them. It'll bless you and you can find it without having to go to the table of contents. Amen, Brother Ron. That's good reason. All right. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 25, and the, ver the verse says, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Father, we ask you to bless the sermon today. Father, I know that there are people listening to me here and around the world by the internet that need to make spiritual decisions for you. Lord, I can't help them. I can just preach the Word. I can pray for them that they would listen and, and follow your leading of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I'm just one man. I'm a voice in the wilderness here in Texas. And yet, Lord, you can take these words and apply them to hearts around the world. I pray, Father, that every person in the sound of my voice today in this room, Father, would, that needs to make a spiritual decision, would make that today. Father, for those that are watching on the internet that are not saved, help them to get saved today. For those who are not in a good church, help them, Father, to say, I'm going to find a church, and I'm going to go there, and I'm going to join it, and I'm going to be faithful and be a part of that church. Father, I pray that you would call forth laborers into your harvest, that you would call men and women, Father, to go into your ministry to serve you. And Lord, I pray that we together, as your people, would help fulfill your great commission that we read in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, where you told us to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize everyone in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Father, to teach them to observe all things that you've commanded us to do. Lord, I ask that you would help us to do that and be faithful. Even in these last days when there's all kinds of warfare and problems going on around the world, the, the Lord's coming is at hand, and Father, we ask today, <clears throat> that you would help us to not do our thing, but to do your thing. Not to follow what we want to do, but, Father, to do what you want us to do, to be submissive to you and your will. Father, bless this sermon. We'll ask you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, do it your way and see what happens. Now, what does it mean when I say, do it your way? We have this hamburger company called Burger King and they say, do it your way, have it your way, do it your way. You can order the hamburger like you want. I like that. You know, some people like it with nothing on it, some people like it with everything on it. I don't know. That's good. And but you know, when it comes to spiritual out spiritual things, it's not good to do it your own way. Now I'm not gonna move, the camera's not gonna move, but over here on my left, on your right, we have a flannel graph lesson that we had for Sunday school about Cain and Abel. And if you don't remember, Adam and Eve were the first human beings on the earth. The Bible says that God created them. He made them out of the dust of the ground, and He breathed into them, and they became living souls. And Eve had two children, Cain and Abel. And as they were growing up, their mother and father taught them the truth about what it meant to, to be right with God, to offer the correct, proper sacrifice, which in those days was a lamb without spot, without blemish. And so I want us to take our Bibles now, and we're going to go into um, <clears throat> Genesis chapter number um, 4, and we're going to read some verses. 
And they're self-explanatory. I'll read them out loud for you on the internet. But folks here that have Bibles are opening to Genesis chapter 4. And we're going to read the story. And then I'm going to comment about it as we go down the line in these verses. Because this is called exegesis. This is teaching that way, verse by verse. We're going to do that. Some may accuse me of not going to the Bible enough. Well, we're going today. So I hope you have your Bibles. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And the Bible says there in verse number 1, let's start uh, verse 4, verse 4. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain. They had a child, his name was Cain. And, the, and he said, and she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. First child born in the Bible. Isn't that something? that we have recorded. Uh, that's verse 1. Verse 2, And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was the keeper of sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. So we have here occupations. One's a farmer, and the other one is a sheep herder, sheep keeper, okay? And verse 3, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground and offering to the Lord. Now if you look on my left, on your right, up here, we have Cain who brought a beautiful sacrifice as his offering. Now notice now in verse 3 it says, in the process of time. Now what does that mean? These, young, these boys were growing up to be men. They were in their occupations. They probably had their own families going by this time. And it came time for them to offer unto God the sacrifice that he commanded all of his children to offer. Okay? And the sacrifice was a lamb without blemish and without spot. So he offered his sacrifice, the fruit of the ground. Now let me tell you about the sacrifice, the fruit of the ground. It was what Cain had made. It was what he had provided with his economic ability to, 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 to produce. Whenever you produce something out of the ground, it costs money. You have money for your equipment, you have money for the seed, you have money for the water that you have to pay to get to it if you don't have water, and the, the money that you need to harvest that crop and to get it ready to, to, to put out in the public. So Cain had lots of money invested in his sacrifice. That's only a representation of what that was here on the final graph board. I can't accurately describe but you can imagine that it was beautiful and that it was expensive. It was something wonderful, out of this world. He says, there, I did it. I put it up there, and surely God is going to love my sacrifice. Let's read the Bible. Verse 4. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat of Now notice the firstlings. That means it was the best sheep he had. I get a little amazed. When people give a missionary offering and they give them used tea bags and used zippers. Well, we gave to missions. They can, they can heat water and use those tea bags. They've only been used once. And people have that concept about missions. Well, they're just missionaries. It doesn't matter. What about God? God wants us to give our best, our very best. I think if you have children today, you ought to offer them to the Lord. And say, Lord, I pray that they serve you in their lives, and maybe you call them to preach. Amen. Or to serve you, and this, Lord, this is our best we want to give to you. That's what you should say as a parent, I believe. Give your very best. And here Abel brought the firstlings of the flock. Not the lastlings, the firstlings. I like that. You know what we do? The second we get our, our, our income, Peggy and I, we tie that money. It goes yeah. right into the church. And I have a little system I do. I'll tell you what it is, in case you ever want to do this. Because I do it on computer and I watch it, you know. And, of course, I write the check out and everything. But on the check, I put, like, in the cents part, like, instead of, like, X number of dollars, with no cents, I put one cent, two cents, three. I do that to correspond with the month that I gave so that I'll have a record to know that I gave that month. X dollars and two cents. X dollars and three cents. So we gave X dollars and... Uh, seven cents this past uh, this month. So I know when I look at my online computer statement of my bank account, I know, hey, I gave this month. Great. Praise God, I gave this month. All right. Firstlings of the flock. So what does that mean today? I believe it means when you first get your income, the first thing you give out of that income is your tithe to the Lord. 
People don't like to hear that. Well, Brother Ron, you don't know what I need. Excuse me? God said, if you'll give that tithe, I will bless you. And I will pour out God my blessings upon you that you should not be able to receive it. That's Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. I know most of you do, and I'm glad you do. Praise God for that. But maybe we have somebody on the internet that's listening and is not doing that. The Lord wants that first 10%. The first. Tithe means 10. So give your tithe, and God will bless you, I promise. Okay. So he brought the first things of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord, look at verse 4, the last part of the verse. And the Lord, that's Jehovah, it's in capital letters, had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Why? Because it was the proper and correct offering that he gave. The first things of the flock. What do you think, Brother Gilbert? Is that true? Mm -hmm. All right. Now notice verse 5. Let's talk about his brother Cain. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Translation. He didn't accept his offering. God says, it's real pretty, but I don't care about it. It isn't the offering I wanted you to give. It isn't the appropriate offering. And then notice the last part in verse 5. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. He was ticked off. You ever get ticked off before? I've seen some of you get ticked off. I know what you look like when you're mad. You probably know what I look like when I'm mad. But Cain was really mad. Boy, was he mad. He was spitting nails. He was so mad. He was really ticked off. All right? And then notice verse 6. How the Lord gently, kindly came to Cain. And you know what? When God does that, it's like pouring salt in the wound because you know you did bad. And he's just coming to you. Remember like he came to Adam and Eve? Adam in the garden said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam says, he was hiding. He said, He said, finally they began to talk. And uh, he blamed his wife. He didn't take the blame. Look, when you mess up, take the blame. Admit that you're wrong. And God will bless you if you will do that. Admit it. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so mad? Why is your countenance fallen? If you will do well, wouldn't you not be accepted? Verse number 7. What does that mean? It means... Cain, I'm going to give you a chance to bring that offering you should bring, and I'm going to accept it, and everything's going to be okie dokie if you'll do that. And it really made Cain mad. He says, Who, oh, you're not going to tell me what to do? Boy, that's the characteristic of some person that wants to say, I'm going to do it my way. You're not going to tell me what to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. Okay, do it your way and see what happens. That's the sermon title, amen? All right. And then notice what God said in the last part of 7. If you do, do not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain, verse 8, talked with his, Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. He killed him. The first murder in the Bible. And it wasn't the last one. Question, is it wrong to murder? Yes. But this is out and out murder. And then some time passed, and the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Verse number 9. And he said, I don't know where he's at. Am I my brother's keeper? What a question. That's one of the most famous questions of all time. Am I my brother's keeper? What do you think the answer is? Yes. We are responsible to one another. I'm responsible to you, our church family. You're responsible to me. Okay? And we're here. We're trying to get through all this and, and hear the shout and go to heaven. Amen? So anyway, we are a brother's keeper. That means when you have a brother or sister in need, you help them. Hello? You help them. You don't just say, God bless you. See you Sunday. You help them. All right? Just want to encourage you. Amen, Brother Ron. All right. Amen, Brother Ron. That's good preaching. All right. Verse number 10, and he said, What have you done? God sang to, to, to Cain. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hands. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. 
He's going to be a stranger. He's going to be traveling all over. No one's going to love him. No one's going to accept him. God's going to put a mark on him to say, don't kill him or it'll be worse for, him, for you than it was for him. And what does he say here in verse number nine, 9? Verse 13, I'm sorry. My punishment is greater than I can bear. I'm telling you, pretty sad times. And he was driven from the face of the earth, verse 14. And the Lord said in verse 15, Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. The Lord set a mark upon him, lest any finding, of, finding him should kill him. And one of the saddest verses in the Bible, verse number 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now i got to ask you a question. Was, it, was there still opportunity for Cain to pray and ask God's forgiveness? Yes. Cain could have fell, fallen face first before God and said, Oh, Father, forgive me. Do you remember the, 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 the Pharisee and the publican? I believe it was the book of Luke. And the publican, the Pharisee said, I thank you, God, that I am not like this publican, this tax collector. I tithe, I do this. And, and what did the tax collector do? He fell down the public in the tax plate. He fell down. He said, Lord, be merciful to me. And that publican went to his publican, not Republican, but publican went to his house justified. He got saved. And I still believe in my heart of hearts that if Cain would have just fallen before God and begged his mercy and forgiveness, the God of the grace of heaven would have forgiven him. But he didn't. And what does it say here? And Cain went out. You know what? When people leave God, they, they do it, not God. You know, I've heard people say, well, I'm mad at God because he, he killed my dad. I heard a lady say that. I'm so mad at God because he killed my dad. I want nothing to do with God. You know what? That's dangerous thin ice to be walking on. We're all sinners. We all need God, and we need to seek Him from our hearts and humble ourselves before Him. Amen. We need to do that. And I believe that Cain left the presence of the Lord because he wanted to do his thing. Do what you want to do and see what happens. Did Cain do what he wanted to do? Yep. From beginning to end, Cain did what he wanted to do. And what happened? Now we see him away from his people, away from his family, and away from the presence of the Lord. That's one of the saddest verses in the whole Bible. All right, what do we know about all this? Number one, God has a plan for our lives. Wherever we are, now listen real close. You need to stop where you are in life and look at yourself and say, am I doing what God wants for me or am I doing what I want to do for me? Question, what am I doing? Why am I, what am I doing right now? And you're either doing what you want to do or you're doing what God wants you to do. It's either or. You can't have it both ways. Amen. God has a plan for our lives. So what you have to do is just stop right where you are, draw a circle around your feet, and say, Lord, am I following you? Or am I doing like Cain did, doing what I want to do? It's like what he wanted to do. And we're going to look at him. Now we're, we're going to summarize this. Look, God has a plan for our lives. Number two, God expects every man, woman, boy, and girl to obey him and to do what he told them to do. That's what God expects from every one of us. I'm not exempt, you're not exempt, and you're not exempt on the internet. God has a plan, and He's told us what to do, and He wants us to do His will. End of story on that one, all right? Number three, Cain brought the wrong sacrifice. Didn't he? Remember? Guess what? Things happen. Okay, He brought the wrong sacrifice, all right? Abel's sacrifice was the correct sacrifice and was accepted. God gave Cain a second chance to do right. What did Cain do? I'm not, I don't agree with that, Lord. I'm just going to do my own thing. I don't care. And he got so mad. Who did he get mad at? Did he get mad at God or did he get mad at his brother? See, here's another principle that you see. Sometimes when you witness to people and you share with them the truth, they get mad at you. They get mad at me. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. He's the one that called the shots. He's the one that made the commands. Your, his anger was misdirected. He got mad at his brother instead of God. Maybe he thought, I can't get back at God, so I'll just get mad, get, get, get mad at my brother and take it out on him. But you go from bad to worse. So the worst was he killed his brother. 
God said that God came to deal with Cain. And I still believe that God would have accepted his repentance if he had fallen on his face before God and asked him to forgive him of his sin. Do you think that murderers on death row can get saved? Yes. Do you believe that? I believe that. Yeah. You know what? I don't even believe that Putin and Russia could get saved if he would just humble his heart and pray to the Lord Jesus and ask him to forgive him of his sins of murder and all the rotten, wicked things that, he, that they do. Anybody, Hussein could have gotten saved. Hitler could have gotten saved. Because God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repent. Amen? Everybody. Amen. Even Cain. Even the murderer that he was. God came to deal with him, and Cain failed to admit his sin and ask God to forgiveness. And eventually, God's judgment came down on Cain. I submit to you, it's my opinion, that Cain is in hell right now. Because he was unwilling to follow the Lord and do God's will. Whew. Can I tell you something, a little secret? I, I know I keep talking about the church where I grew up. But I can, I, we were in a large church. For us, it was large. We were running an average of 400 every Sunday. We had Sunday school buses. We had kids. We had teenagers. We had adults. We had seniors. We had a good preacher. We had a staff. We had good music. We had good everything. But I can, And I've been in Sunday school all of my life. But I can tell you on one hand how many people I know of in that Sunday school that are still going to church today. On one hand. What do you think about that? I think it's pretty sad. I think they didn't get discipled. They didn't grow in the Lord. You know what? We've got some folks here that are just skating on thin ice with the Lord. You're not getting discipled. You know why you're not? You don't want to. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't want to come to church. I don't want to. Okay, just do your own thing. And you may get to heaven if you're You'll get to heaven if you're saved. But don't be expecting any rewards in heaven or blessings. Because, you know what? God wants you to just get involved. Let me ask you this question. Years ago, when you started your very first job, I mean your real first job, and you were getting paid for it, did you just have a happy-go-lucky, I don't care attitude about that job, or were you putting your whole self into that job? I mean, every little detail, you were going early, you were staying late, you were doing little extra things the boss didn't ask you to do, but you were doing it because you want it to be a blessing and you wanted that job to grow and you to make more money. Am I telling the truth? I was that way. Well, you know what? The church is like that too. We're not here just to say, oh, season is in it. That doesn't hold with God. God wants us to roll up our sleeves and get involved. And you know where you start first? At home with your Bible. That's where you start first. Are you in your Bible? Are you reading it? Are you studying it? Are you learning the books of the Bible? We got this Bible schedule. Are you reading it? I hope you are. Even if it's just one verse a day, even if it's just one verse a day, that's something. You know, you heard the, 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 the saying, you got to crawl before you can walk. Well, that's crawling. But crawling's okay if that's all you can do. Crawl. Okay? I know I'm stepping on toes. It's real quiet. All right. Number two, why does do it your way get us in trouble with God? Why does doing it your way get us in trouble with God? Now, we're not talking about Last, remember last week we talked about decisions, and we're talking about all, we're not talking about decisions, we're talking about spiritual things here, alright? We're talking about the big things. Bringing that sacrifice to God was a big thing for Cain and Abel, big, and they brought it, they brought their best. Cain brought the wrong sacrifice, Abel brought the correct sacrifice, alright? So, what's the real lesson here? Now you'll see... Over Cain's sacrifice, I have a man cutting wood. You see that? And on the right there, where you see Abel, over, the, over that sacrifice, you see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me explain what the problem, the real problem of Cain and Abel is for us today. Because we need to apply this to us. Amen? You know what? It's good to talk about the Bible, but unless we make the application to us, it doesn't do much good for us. Am I telling the truth? So I know you're here for that reason, so I'm going to talk about All right. First thing that's wrong with Cain's sacrifice was that it was he was presenting a salvation of good works. Good works. What are good works? I'm going to go out and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. 
I'm going to make flowers, I'm going to bring vegetables, I'm going to bring up a beautiful arrangement, and I'm going to provide, I'm going to do it myself. I grew it in my garden, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that, I did this, and here's my offering to you, Lord. And, and I hope you accept it. You know there's people today that believe if they give money, that they're going to buy favor with God. Or people believe if they get baptized, they're going to buy favor with God. Baptism can't save you. It's only uh, a testimony of your salvation and identification with your church. That's what baptism is, okay? So what about people who say, well, you know what? I take in strangers and I feed the home homeless and help those and these, these, uh, these immigrant children that need help. I'm going to take them into my house and I'm going to help them. And really down in your heart you're saying, well, if I do this, I'm buying favor with God. Why? Because there's the biggest lie you're ever going to hear, please listen to me on the internet, the biggest lie you're ever going to hear from Satan is this. Satan is going to tell you that your whole life, everything you do, God's going to put you on a holiness scale. Okay? And if you do more good than the bad that you do, that's going to outweigh your bad. Okay? And then you'll have favor with God. People believe this. They believe, well, I'm really a good person and, and I know that I've done more good than I've done bad. That's called salvation by works. Good works. Are the good works good? Of course they're good. Is giving money good? Yes. Is, is, is helping people a good thing? Yes. But if you think for one second that by being good it's going to buy you favor with God, you're crazy. Because you have to bring the right sacrifice for the offering. Those, the, those flowers there on that flannel board, that is the most beautiful offering you ever saw in your life. It is great. But it represents the works of Cain. His works. Now what does the Bible say? For by grace are you saved, by faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If Cain is in heaven because he gave that sacrifice, he can go up to God and say, Oh God, look what I did to earn my salvation. Ain't I good? Look what I did. I can brag on that. I'm going to boast on that. But God says you can't do that. Because it's, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. All right. Now let's compare that with uh, Abel's offering. Abel brings this land. He kills it. He burns it. And the smoke goes up. And it's the acceptable sacrifice. That sacrifice is a picture of Jesus Christ dying on the cross many years later. Because Jesus is our sacrifice. That bloody, ugly sacrifice of Him dying on the cross. He was beaten to a pole. He was beaten so much you couldn't even tell it was a man. He was beaten so much for our, for our, just for our, for our sins so that we could be saved. Alright? So anyway, let's talk about that. You cannot be saved by your works. Now the question is, why can we not be saved by our works? First of all, there's nothing in us that's good. I'm not perfect. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. You probably already knew that, but just ask her. She'll tell you. Ask my family. They'll tell you. They all know. They know me. All right? But there are people that think, oh, if I just do all this good stuff, I'm going to be okay with God. Let me give you a verse. Isaiah 64.6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our unrighteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, our sins, like the wind, have taken us away from God. Why? Because all of our unrighteousness is as filthy rags. Now, Brother Gilbert was in the hospital this week. He's got a little thing on his arm where they gave him an IV. Now, Brother Gilbert, what would you think if the nurse had taken that place where you were bleeding there and they went into the uh, trash can and got an old, dirty piece of cloth and put on that and put a bed? What would you think about that if that, they did that? Would you be happy about that? No, sir. No, sir, he said. Right! Because you want it clean and sterile, amen? amen? And you know what? Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags to God. There's nothing that we can do to buy favor with God. Nothing. Zero. Absolutely nothing. All right? So as far as Cain goes, that's strike one. We're in the baseball season. Strike one. All right? Next thing that we know about Cain is that he tried to get to, get to God 
without the proper sacrifice of being saved, being born again. All right, Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Have you been born again? I was born again. I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and He saved me. But you know what? Cain didn't want to do that. Cain wanted to offer sacrifice and do it his way. He wanted to do it his way. Ding! Strike two for Cain. Alright? And then the strike three is coming up. You know what strike three means, right, Aiden? It means you're out. After he sinned, he brought the wrong offering, and God says, if you'll bring the right offering, it'll be okay. But what did Cain do? He said, I'm not going to do that. I want to do my own thing. And what did he do? He got mad and went out and he killed his brother in the field. Tried to hide his body. And God says, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And God dealt with him. And Cain still was unwilling to repent and do it God's way. Ding! Strike three. You're out, Cain. You're out. It's too late. And that's what Cain did to cause all of his trouble. Now how can we relate all this to us today? Number three. How does Cain and Abel relate to us? That's a good question. We're not talking about being good. We're not talking about just little bitty things, but we're talking about spiritual choices. Now, you're here secluded in Stephenville. I've been over the world. I've preached in many places. In Bible college, I studied, studied many churches. I studied the Catholic Church, the Mormon Church, and many other churches. And I want you to know something today. There's four basic kinds of churches in this world. Five, really, five. There's the kind like us that cut it off the cob right. That's the one, okay? Then there's four other that I want to talk about. One is a modernistic church. What is a modernistic church? That's a church that says, we're just getting better and better, and you just be good, do the best you can, and it'll all come out in the wash okay with God. That's really the church that Cain was a part of. Just be good, do your best, and it'll, it'll all come out in the wash. Modernism. Watering down the gospel. Watering down the word of God. It doesn't matter. Just, just do your best and be good. Poor little thing. We'll pray you get, get to feeling better. All right. Secondly, the humanistic church. Man is getting better. We have more education. We have more of this. We have more of everything. The, the world is a world of tranquility today. Have you heard that before? The press conference? Obama? We're living in a world of tranquility. They're living in La La Land in Washington. They don't know what's going on. Humanism means... Man is getting stronger. Man is getting wiser. Man is just getting better and better. More education, more government influence, more everything. And we just worship mankind today. Man, humanistic church. God, Christ, salvation. No, we believe in evolution. We believe that killing babies is okay. We believe in all these things because it's the human way to do it. It's, it's, if it feels good, do it. That's what humanism is. If it feels good, do it. That's what they believe, all right? Ecumenicalism is another kind of church. What do they believe? They believe that we're all together. We're like one big church. It doesn't matter what name you are. We're all going to the same place. And yet they think it's up there. And I'm thinking, I don't think it's up there. I think it's down there. Because when you say we're all brothers in Christ, you know what? I, I really get upset at preachers. And I have a few preacher friends that talk like that. They're just, they don't want to make anybody upset. They don't want to say there's a division between churches. They want to say, oh, we're just one big happy church family. We love everybody. I'm thinking, what? There's differences in churches. Do you realize that? That there are great differences in doctrine in churches? Mm -hmm. And when you say, well, we just love everybody, that's ecumenicalism. We want to have one big church. That's what's going to happen during the tribulation time with the Antichrist. One big church. And then the last church that we hear of, and it's kind of new, you may have heard the word, it's called Chrislam. You ever heard that term before? Chrislam is a marriage between Christianity and Mohammedism. Chrislam. Islam and Christianity together. And there are some Baptist churches that lean towards accepting that and promoting that. Chrislam. They're not churches that we fellowship with, by the way. 
What does that mean? That means we're going to take our crosses down and everything in our church that offends Muslims, and we want to be lovey-dovey with the Muslims. Invite them in here to speak to Chrislam. And so this is what happens when you do things your way instead of God's way. What did God say? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What is John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Acts 4, 2. Amen. There is no other name. We, up, we lift up the name of Christ to the cross of Jesus. We uplift, we've got a picture over here of him on the wall carrying his cross. We have a cross behind me that's up there representing the empty cross because he's in heaven today. And I'm telling you, we proudly promote Jesus Christ as our only Savior, our priest, and the one we live for in this church. He is our Savior, our all in all. We sing about him, we talk about him, and we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And we sang a song, that we sang a children's song today, Jesus loves me, this I know. Why? Because the Bible tells me so. We know that He loves us today. And I'm telling you today, with all my heart, I'm saying, we're going to stand up against <coughs> ecumenicalism and compromise and sin of all kinds. If we bring it in this church, we're going to kick it right out of here. I don't care what happens. All right, now, one last thing and I'll be done. Sometimes we get Christians who are saved. They really are saved. But, they're kind of like spiritual brats. Well, Brother Ron, what's that? I mean, I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way. Don't, God, don't tell me what to do. Can I translate all that for you? And there's maybe somebody watching on the internet today. A spiritual brat is somebody who wants a fire escape from hell, and yet they want to live their life as they please until the trumpet sounds. Get quiet in your bed, you get real quiet. All right, spiritual brats. Well, I just have my sins and I'm just going to do whatever I want. It's okay because God understands. Oh, really? God understands? Let's read some verses. How about 2 Corinthians 6 17? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? For what communion hath light with darkness? All right, verse 17. Wherefore, Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. How about 1 John chapter 2? Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And then lastly today, how about Romans 12, 1 and 2? Paul said to the church at Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm telling you today, we got some Christians in this world that are say they're going to heaven, but they're spiritual brats. Because you know why they say, I want to do it my way. I want to do it my way. What happened to Cain when he said that? He got in big trouble, didn't he? Guess what? Christian, if you want to do it your way, be careful. Because your way may not be God's way. What's our text today? We go back to Proverbs. Proverbs in chapter number 16, verse 21, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now look, I don't know everybody here intimately, but I know this, that God puts things in my heart to preach. And I preach them. I just let them go, let them rip. And I want to say this, if you've got spiritual issues in your life, I want you to remember Cain, because he always said, I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what you say, what God says, I'm going to do it my way. Well, don't you do it your way. Do it God's way. Try the Lord and see if He isn't precious and that He won't bless you and encourage you and, and, and make your life what really it ought to be. Serving Him, giving yourself to Him, not to the sins of this world and to the whims of the flesh. Remember, having it your way is okay at Burger King, but it's not okay with the Lord. 
Don't have it your way. Have it God's way. Live for the Lord. Let Him be your all in all. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody moving today except Brother Burl. He's okay. Peggy's coming to the piano today. And today we talked about having it your way. We talked about Cain and Abel. Cain didn't get it. He didn't get it right. He blew it. And maybe you blew it today. As a believer, maybe there's things in your life that you're not really proud of and you're saying, you know what? This whole thing's just got to end right now because it's not right. It just isn't right. Whatever it can be, I don't know. But if God's dealing with you about a spiritual issue, I want you to pray today and I'll pray with you. And we'll invite. If you need to get saved, boy, what a time to get saved today. This world's coming to an end. Jesus is coming back. He can come back today. And if your bags are packed and ready, you're going. But if you're not saved, you're not going with us. I hope you get saved. And if you're saved and you're not living close to the Lord, come on, come back to Him. He loves you. And just like He called Cain to go get the proper offering, He invited him to. He challenged him to. I want to challenge you today. Get right with the Lord. Don't have it your way. Have it God's way. Father God, today, thank you for your blessings. I pray you bless this invitation time. And whatever spiritual needs need to be done today, I pray, that Lord, that you would help those that need to say yes to you. May they have a warm and pliable heart. And listening to your spirit and listening to your word and thinking about what your will is for their lives. Bless this invitation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many can say, Brother Ron, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. If you can say, I know I'm saved, would you slip up your hand and let me know that you know you're saved? God bless you, God bless you, God. Amen. All right. How many say, Brother Ron, there is a spiritual issue in my life God's dealing with, dealing with me about. And I want to ask you to pray for me. And I don't care who you are today. I will pray for you. I will not mention your name or where you are. It's just between you and me and the Lord. Brother Ron, pray for me today. Is there one? You can raise a hand and say, there's two hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? Pray for me, Brother Ron. For my old heart. God's speaking to me. Pray for me, Brother Ron. Anybody else? While we wait just another minute. You know what Satan says in the invitation time? You can do this, but do it next Sunday. No, no. God says right now. Right now. How many else can say it? There's another hand. God bless you. Anybody else? Pray for me, Brother Ron. Pray for me. I will. God bless you. There's four people. Anybody else? Raise a hand and say, Brother Ron, pray for me. How many can say, Brother Ron, I need to be baptized. I need to become a member of this church because you're cutting off the cop straight. And it's right out of the book. Brother Ron, pray for me that I submit to believer's baptism and become a member of this church. Anybody can do it. Pray for me, Brother Ron. Anybody? We won't do it today, but we'll do it soon. Anybody? Pray for me, Brother Ron. How many can say, Brother Ron, I'm having some real problems in my life and I need you to pray for me. It could be personal. It can be family. It can be financial. It can be health-wise. Brother Ron, please pray for me today. Is there one? Pray for me, Brother Ron. There's one hand. Anybody else? Anybody else? Lord God, today we thank you for these hands that were raised. And Lord, I know. I've been in church all my life, Lord, and I know that every invitation time has people in that invitation who need to make a spiritual decision. Lord, you know hearts, not me, but you. So, Lord, I pray that you would convict us of our needs before you. And, Lord, help us to say yes to you. And help us to, Father, humble ourselves before you. And, Father, for those who need to be baptized in our room here, I pray they would say yes to you. And they would follow your footsteps and do your will. Father, for every other need, I pray for those that are sick, those that are hurting, those that are hungry for uh, a, a spouse or a, a, a companion, Lord, that you would provide that need. Lord, I pray for Brother Gilbert. You'd help him with his physical ailments for Jan, that you'd help her to get healed. And Father, all the other needs that are here today, Lord, I pray you. But, but Lord, help us to remember that the day of reckoning came for Cain and God, you dealt with him. Now, Lord, you're dealing with us today. So, Lord, help us to recognize that and to be the Christian that we ought to be and say yes to you. Help us not to be like Cain. Help us to be like Abel, who is obedient, who is submissive, and said, yes, Lord, thy servant speaketh, and I follow you. 
Lord, help us to follow you today. In the name of Jesus, I pray you bless this invitation. Amen. So let's all stand, please, Amen. as we enter the invitation. As we stand today, if you need to step forward and pray, we're going to make an altar up here. We don't have a very good one yet. We're going to take some chairs and we're going to sit up here. We're going to invite you, if you need to come and pray, you come up here by our new baptistry right here. You can, there's room there to kneel and to pray. God has spoken to your heart. It's not to me, it's to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Join the song if you know it. I surrender all. I surrender